Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club for our luncheon today with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the President of the Islamic Republic of Iran. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm President of the National Press Club and Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests who are joining us here today, along with the working press and the audience that's watching us on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech and afterwards, I will ask as many questions from the audience as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Ron Bajans, Washington correspondent for the Kuwait News Agency. Lucy Morion, Washington representative for Reporters Without Borders. Ken Melgren, manager of affiliate relations at Associated Press Broadcast. Hiroki Sugita, Washington Bureau Chief of Kyoto News Agency of Japan. Donna Leinwand, correspondent for USA Today and treasurer of the National Press Club. Clarence Page, columnist and member of the editorial board at the Chicago Tribune. Dr. Kave Afraziabi, professor of international relations at Bentley College, author of books on Iran's foreign and nuclear policies and a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the podium, Angela Greiling Keene of Bloomberg News, the chair of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Myron Belkind, a member of the Speakers Committee and the member of the committee who organized today's luncheon. Greta Van Susteren, anchor of Fox News is on the record. John Allen, correspondent for Congressional Quarterly. Eleanor Clift, contributing editor to Newsweek and regular panelist on the McLaughlin Group. And Tom Baldwin, Washington Bureau Chief for the Times of London. For nearly a century now, the National Press Club has brought the world's leading newsmakers to this stage. Yasser Arafat, Golda Meir, Nelson Mandela, and Nikita Khrushchev are just a few of the notables who have all addressed the world from the National Press Club. And today, we are hosting one of the most newsworthy heads of state in the world, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, President of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Here at the National Press Club, it's our job to facilitate the news, to help bring newsmakers and journalists together. That's exactly what we're doing here today. We're not endorsing anything the President has said or will say, just as we didn't endorse what Fidel Castro said when he spoke at the National Press Club. We simply arranged for this opportunity for President Ahmadinejad to share his thoughts with us. One thing is different and historic about this National Press Club luncheon. This is the first video conference luncheon in the 100-year history of the National Press Club. We in invited President Ahmadinejad to join us via video from New York, where he is attending the UN General Assembly. President Ahmadinejad, welcome to the National Press Club. Thank you very much. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. The president is reciting verses from the Holy Quran in Arabic. I am very glad to sit down and meet with members of the press and congratulate the hundredth year of your activities and at the outset, I would like to uh, raise a fundamental uh, question on a key issue. I'd like to invite all to look at world events. When we take a look around us, we're not happy with what we see. Indeed, it is the most unsatisfactory state of affairs. Insecurity, discrimination, and threats of war and security concerns have affected everyone. Continuous wars have, in fact, hurt the human spirit. I believe if we look at the root cause uh, some of these problems, we will be able to think of how to build a better future, a more prosperous future based on peace and security for all humanity. 
من فکر میکنم همه باور داریم که می توان شرایط بهتری to create a better world for humanity. برای تحقق این هدف And to realize this sublime and beautiful goal. We need to take a look and revise how we view the world around us. In looking for the root causes of the world problems today, we first look confront deviations on how mankind is viewed and how the world is viewed through the prism and point of view, in fact, of some politicians and statesmen. I would say we believe in the sublime value of humanity. The Almighty God has replaced Man on has replaced his position with man's position on earth. As his representative, he gave dignity to him and respect and called on mankind to make every effort to move towards a prosperous life and to walk on the sublime path that will help achieve it. God placed man on earth as his representative and to guide him he sent his prophets. God placed the world in man's hand and helped man control it. Gave man talents with the ability to grow those talents and place no limits on man's progress in that respect. God created man above the material being and placed that material being into man's hands for his possession. What these means is that God placed man on a high status and respected him. So to God, man is a unified truth beyond geographical borders, colors, or ethnicity. God and all his prophets have addressed all human beings from all segments of life. The greatest harm to mankind is to prevent him from pursuing education. To prevent him from moving on the sublime divine path. فطرت روح خدایی در انسان است. Nature of mankind is endued with God's spirit. روح خدایی انسان را به علم، به حکمت، به عشق، به محبت، به زیبایی، enmity and all forms of grudges that we now hold against each other. No one should distort the beauty of thought and the beauty of feeling and emotion from man. Family is the center of love and beauty. Fathers, mothers, and children each are a center for giving love. Peace and tranquility is based in the family. No one has the right to take away this divine gift from humanity. The result of love and kindness is the ability to render service, to sacrifice oneself for other people. That should not be prevented. Kindness and love also gives the result of forgetting about oneself for others. This is a realization of the sublime beauty of mankind that must not be denied to him. The security of thought 
یک حق و یک ضرورت است امنیت و اطمینان در پرتو خدا پرستی به دست می آید and the belief in God, those who believe in God, seek His assistance and depend on Him, the God who is the absolute power, who is the absolute knowledge, the absolute knowledge, and who loves His beings. از مظلومان دفاع میکند هر کس به چنین خدای مؤمن باشد احساس آرامش میکند هر کس رضایت چنین خدایی را تحصیل کند هیچ ترس و نگرانی نخواهد داشت البته رضایت خدا در اطاعت خداست to seek God's um, approval, one must follow Him. Following God means to respect the rights of others. To render respect and kindness to others. To engage in pious acts and behaviors. To remember God. Following God meaning means wanting the best for all others. To invite them to good and to tell them to refrain from bad. Insecurity happens when remembrance of God and following Him is weakened. When a group are not satisfied about their rights, they will become aggressors. And when the rights of another group of people and another land and other people's resources are usurped, insecurity arises when the boundaries of people is broken, insecurity is robbed from them. That's when the threat of arms and nuclear arms overshadows the tranquility that mankind had before. Insecurity prevails. And when security is taken away, the talents are no longer flourished. The happiness and joy of life is replaced by fear. Insecurity prevents man's progressive development and it distorts man's vision from achieving its sublime path, goal. My friends, man is a divine creature. It has the talent to move towards the indefiniteness of beauty, of joy and greatness. The human path is a movement from darkness to light. The truth of the world of this universe is pure. And the creator of the world is, has no, is free of all forms of lies and deceits and oppression. The right path is the path to piety. Lies are incompatible with the truth of mankind and with the adjectives that the Divine Lord has given us for humanity. Lies are an incorrect reflection of the reality and a reflection of those behavior of the liars and the way they think. Lies has nothing to do, have nothing to do with the divine spirit of mankind. Lies deviate thoughts and lead to judgments and that weaken the truth and deviate man's path. Therefore, lies and deceits are in fact 
a form of oppressing mankind. We are all against that form of oppression. Powers or human beings who create insecurity and impose it on the world. انسان این موجود الهی را از شکوفایی و بالندگی باز می‌دارد. و چه ظلمی از این بالاتر که اجازه ندهند انسان پای بر سر و آسمان بکشد. بنابراین ناامنی، خشونت، فقط یک چالش و مانع و امر ناخوشایند are not all simple challenges or perhaps one oppression or deviation from the collective rights of individuals and people. That, that, that is not just simply the case. Rather, it goes broader. That level of insecurity is oppressing mankind in its totality. Tribal violences, ethnic violences, imposed by the powerful groups, by the oppressors, is in fact a form of oppressing mankind altogether. Of course, insecurity does not arise only through security activities or through police activities or through indirect means, but principally, the mind should not be marred by که او را در تفکر و تأمل انتخاب مسیر صحیح مادگرایی، غیر اخلاقی، زن و روح و قلب بشر را از توجه به پاکی ها باز می‌دارد و مانع حرکت و تکاپو و تلاش می‌شود. این هم ناامنی ذهنی است. در تعلیمات انبیاء الهی این مانع رشد انسان است. Are what prevent man from growing. In this logic, there are no principles. Rather, there is a propensity to engage in corruption. And all that it represents, and that all hurts man's movement towards the sublime path. Define a branch of insecurity of the mind and of the thought. We disagree with that. We do not like to see that prevail. And I think that to have a better world, our vision of how we look at mankind must change. We have to look at the rights of man, the needs of mankind, and the dignity of mankind. I believe in setting up a prosperous future. The role of the press is very important. The press plays a connecting role, and it provides information and promotes, can serve as a channel for promoting correct thinking. The role of the press is to disseminate moral behavior, to disseminate goodness, purity, honesty, peace, security, and all positive messages that arise from that. And this role is extremely significant. God forbid they must prevent the dissemination of hatred.
و ناپاکی و ناامنی نقش آنها بسیار حساس است رسانه ها می توانند صدای پیامبران الهی باشند یا خدای نکرده صدای بدخواهان و ظالمان زمان می گذرد و به تاریخ می خوب است که همه ما سل سلح و امنیت و پاکی را به یادگار بگذاری البته بعضی قدرتمندان نمیگذارن منافع او در تحقیر انسان منافع اونها در منافع اونها در کنترل جریان منافع اونها در تجاوز منافع اونها در اما مسئولیت انسانی ما ایجاب می کند که واقعیت ها را به درستی منعکس و صلح و دوستی برای همه بشریت باشیم امیدوارم همه ما در انجام از ملاقات با شما بسیار خوشحالم I'm very glad to meet with all of you again today. And I look forward to receiving your comments and views. Thank you very much, President Ahmadinejad. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. We have many, many questions, starting with this, which directly relates to your speech. How important do you think that the worldwide spread of Islam is uh, to creating the sublime and beautiful world that you envision? And is there room for other religions? We think that all religions and all divine religions have the same message. They all come from the same place. They have several clear messages to invite man to worship God, which is the root of all goodness, to invite man to justice, which guarantees love, friendship, and viable security, دعوت به احترام و کرامت انسانی دعوت به عشق به یکدیگر این پیام ها در دین حضرت موسی و دین حضرت عیسی و همینطور حضرت محمد رسول الله موج میزنه پیامبران همه پیام واحد داشتند. These prophets have all given the same messages. پیامبران با هم اختلافی نداشتند. They never had differences in that respect. نزاعی هم نداشتند. There was never a conflict there. چون منشأ اونها یکیست. Because their root goes back to the same reality and their message was the same as well. اونها همه Does that mean there is room for Christianity and Judaism? All that you're describing. در جهانی که شما واس همه با هم برادرند. They're all brothers. We're. همه یک چیز میخوان. They all want the same thing. عدالت و دوستی. Justice and friendship. و این مشترک همه مذاهب. And this is the common ground for all religions. Yes, but do those religions have a place in the world you describe? No, they're all you that don't. They are all human beings and followers of different religions, and all their views should be respected. They, we should all build a prosperous community together, and we must all move hand in hand. This is a responsibility for all. We have many questions uh, regarding the Baha'i religious minority in Iran. Um, many of our questioners say that the Baha'i minority has been de deprived of their human rights. 
what would your response be to that? In our Constitution, Christianity, Judaism, Islam and Zoroastrianism are recognized as the official religions. When we speak of religion, we refer to divine religions. In our country, we follow that law, a law that is based on the majority vote of the people. The 2007 Amnesty International report on Iran said the following. Freedom of expression and association were increasingly curtailed. Internet access was increasingly restricted and monitored. Journalists and bloggers were detained and sentenced to prison or flogging. And at least 11 newspapers were closed. Why? I think people who prepared the report are unaware of the situation in Iran. In our country, law prevails. Freedom is flowing at its highest level. You know that the newspaper that also you know that a government newspaper was actually shut down because it well, engaged in illegal acts. Uh, a newspaper that was reflecting the views of the head of the state. But because it insulted a figure and disrespected the rights uh, of the people by insulting a group at least, it was shut down. You know that on a daily basis, we have tens, uh, many, many newspapers, or dozens of newspapers in our country. And the number of those newspapers that are against the government in place right now are perhaps 10 times larger than the newspapers that are pro-government. In our country, there are tens of millions of people who are connected to uh, the internet. They have access to it. So if you're talking about immoral, like access perhaps to immoral sites, well, you would agree with me that, that those sites are harmful for society. Nobody can really uh, allow access to those. But our people are the freest people in the world, the most aware people in the world, the most enlightened, so to say. So the person who prepared this report, I would say, had he had the chance to walk in Iran, in Tehran, and other cities, and visit them in Iran, and to really sit down with people and speak with them, would have understood that people in Iran are very joyous, happy people, and very free. And very much aware of all world developments on, uh, as it continues on every minute, every second. And they're very free in expressing what they think. Last year in the university, a minority group of 100 people stood against over, uh, against over 2,000 people, students who, were who supported the president, and they were screaming and they tried to disrupt a session. They were left alone. And the president sat down for two hours and listened to all of them. And right now they're free. They're walking freely. I think the people who give this information should seek what is the truth and sort of disseminate what's correct. So I invite everyone present in this meeting to come and visit Iran for themselves, to come freely and visit the country all over, to speak with the people there. Then, their point of view will change. 
Two of the journalists that have been arrested in Iran have been sentenced to death simply for doing their jobs. Mr. President, can you give us your word that you will do everything in your power to keep the sentence from being carried out? This news is fundamentally wrong. This is incorrect. This is not correct at all about Iran. Which journalist has been sentenced to death? I'm sorry that some press here disseminates the, what's untrue. Why should we insist on propagating what's untrue? This report comes from Reporters Without Borders. Well, this is incorrect. Who are these people? Can you let me know who they are so that at least I can be aware of who they are too? I will certainly do that. Moving, moving on. Iranian women are camp... I would be certainly grateful. So right. That would be very helpful to me. Okay, I've just been handed a report from Reporters Without Borders. And it na names the names... Uh, Adnan Hassanpour, and uh, forgive me, this is a little difficult. Abdul Vahed Hiva Botimar. Where were they involved in as a journalist, and where were they arrested? I don't know people by that name. <laughs> I think that what you received was incorrect information. You have to uh, sort of rectify the information channel you have on a daily basis. Over 30 newspapers currently are filled with pages and pages of basically criticizing the president and the administration in Iran and even sometimes insulting our policies and what we do. All the journalists and news papers also receive the loans from the government, actually not loans, but grants from the government. Okay, I think we should move on from that question to the following. Iranian women are campaigning for an end to discrimination. You have charged them with acting against national security. Some women leaders have been beaten and tortured. How do you justify such violations of human rights? Can you again tell me where you get this report from? <laughs> the freest women in the world are women in Iran. You should look at our women. They're active in every level of society. As researchers in social groups, in universities, in parties, in the press, in the arts, in politics, in political associations. They're one of the most active women around in the world and very free. On the anniversary of the victory of the revolution, 22nd of Bahman, Iranian calendar year, over 20 million women come uh, to rally in support of the revolution. And many of them hold key positions. There are two female vice presidents in our country. In very high specialized fields, they're involved as well. Over 60% of university students are female. And especially in the you know, very specialized fields, as I said, our women are, have won medals in uh, international sort of athletic championships. So who said that Iranian women are being tortured in Iran? Human rights organizations have been making those points for years. But uh, again, let's move on to another series of questions. We've got so many topics that we would like to cover. I'm going to try to move quickly. Well, human rights groups say what they want, they say, and we tell them that they're wrong. They have to keep their independence. Okay, moving on to the topic of Iraq. You recently said that Iran was, quote, prepared to fill the gap, unquote, as American influence wanes in Iraq. 
how precisely would you fill this gap? Well, again, this too is one of those distortions by the press. I said our region will soon face a power vacuum. And Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia and regional countries are able to fill in that vacuum. And I also analyzed what I meant. I said that nations, countries in the region, are able to establish security themselves. And they do not need the presence of others in the region in order to arrive at security. This is what I've said very clearly and will say again. I'm surprised why the words are distorted. And what is said is sort of a distortion from the, what was initially said. What role then do you see Iran playing in the future of Iraq? For hundreds of years, we've lived in friendship and brotherhood with the people of Iraq. We want an independent, powerful Iraq, a developed Iraq, which will benefit the entire region. That's what we believe in. We are the ones harmed most by insecurity in Iraq. We like to see peace, tranquility, and progress in Iraq, because people in Iraq have historical ties with us. Annually, millions of people from the two countries travel to the uh, other country. There are a lot of intermarriages. There are many Iranians who are born in Iraq, and many Iraqis who are born in Iran. We are two nations interconnected. We are brothers and friends. We want nothing but goodness and progress for the Iraqi nation. But we think that regional countries themselves can know how to run the affairs of the region best. They don't need a guardian to, from outside to tell them how to do it. The U.S. military yesterday accused Iran of smuggling surface-to-air missiles and other advanced weapons into Iran or into Iraq for use against American troops. Is that true, or will you categorically deny this allegation? We would, uh, will allow the U.S. military there to basically take what it confiscates, whatever of these missiles or whatever of these weapons it claims it ha has or sees in Iraq. We think, in fact, the military should seek an answer to its defeat in Iraq elsewhere in the misguided policies that it has led, in the wrong perspective that it has had towards Iraq and its people. Are those Iranian weapons going into Iraq? They are Iraq. standing against the Iraqi people. Are those Iranian weapons going into Iraq? Because Iraq's security means our security. So is that confirming that those weapons are going in? Oh, no, this does not happen, exist. Are you telling me that the U.S. military is defeated as a result of two or three weapons here and there? There are two problems here. No, I'm simply repeating the government's allegations. First of all, it undermines the power of the U.S. military by making statements like this. We're actually and second of all, U.S. politicians will not be able to make the right decision on matters about Iraq. The the problem of the U.S. military lies elsewhere. Why will Iran... They need to change their methods. Why will Iran not agree to a civilian nuclear partnership with other countries? Why must Iran enrich its own uranium when doing so raises suspicions that it intends to develop nuclear weapons?
اولا این که این حق ماست right. ما عضو آژانس هستیم و اساسنامه آژانس به صراحت این حق رو در سال دو سال قبل ما sort of referred to in the United Nations. But those selfish groups that didn't want to listen to it did not embrace it. And secondly, why should a nation tie its future to another group, another nation? Is the U.S. government willing to engage in partnership with us and advance its nuclear activities in partnership with us? If they're willing to do that, we're willing to do it too. Are they willing to divide their rights with us? Why do you think the U.S. administration, the government, which is a member of the IAEA, should have more rights over Iran, which is also a member of the IAEA? If there is law, international law, it's equal for everyone. Why is it that some people want more rights for themselves? Bernard Kouchner, the new French foreign minister, recently said that the world should prepare for war with Iran if negotiations fail. Is Iran willing to go to war with the West to protect the Iranian nuclear program? First of all, he took back what he said and revised it. And secondly, the United States and France are not the world. Don't speak for the world. And fundamentally, I think the way uh, this way of talking and looking at things is wrong. It's really bad. Whenever a man fails logic, when logic fails, basically, to engage in military threats, we are working under the inspection of the IAEA system, and our activities are legal and for peaceful purposes. Would you be willing to go to war to defend your program? We think that the talk of war is basically a propaganda tool. Why is there a need for war? People who talk about it have to bring a legal reason for going to war. Why should they threaten another country? Why should they create more insecurity? I think officials who talk this kind of talk should, should really be pressured and warned to know what to say and when not to say something. They cannot endanger world security. And if they haven't learned the lesson, then the international community has to tell them how to learn that lesson. Of course, the foreign minister of France revised what he said to it. And I don't think that the French nation is a kind of nation who would want that kind of war. They're a very cultured society, a very cultured group of people, people who have good relations with the Iranian people. I think, of course, to give the foreign minister to gain more experience in his new position, too. And then I'm sure he'll talk from a level with more higher maturity. <laughs> Very well. Is there any circumstance in which the Islamic Republic of Iran and the, and the State of Israel can coexist in peace? ما نظراتمون رو راجع به رژیم صهیونیستی اعلام کردیم. ما رژیم رو به رسمیت نمی‌شناسیم. چون بر پایه اشغال و نجات پرستی است. Excuse me, we're not getting your translation, Mr. President. آقای رئیس جمهور ظاهراً انگلیسی به گوششون نرسید. اگر ما این رژیم رو به رسمیت نمی‌شناسیم. We do not recognize that regime because it is based on discrimination, ethnic discrimination, occupation, and usurpation. And it consistently threatens its neighbors. Last week or so it attacked Syria. And last year it attacked Lebanon. 
And, and when they talk about their goals, they speak about taking over the area between now to the, through the Euphrates. This is occupation and expansionism in the true sense of those words. And they discriminate between people. They kill people. They displace people. They kill young people in their own homes. How is it possible? to recognize it. I'm surprised why members of the press don't raise voices of objection to the policies there. Would you be willing to meet with Holocaust survivors who wanted to discuss their experiences with you and why or why not? What do you want to happen? from this? I don't, I, I'm just asking the question that was handed to me. I raised two questions about the Holocaust. I said if the Holocaust happened and is a reality, when granted that the Holocaust is a reality, then why don't we allow more research to be done on it? Why are European researchers in, sent to prison? when they question some nature or aspect of it. Assuming that it, the Holocaust, well, the reality of the Holocaust is here. It saddens us when any human being is killed. Jews, Christians, Muslims, no difference. But let us remember then, when did, where did the Holocaust happen to begin with? It happened in Europe. And given that, why is it that the Palestinian people should be displaced? Why is it affecting them? Why are they paying the damage of the, by giving up their land? Why? That's what our question is based on. It's a very right question to ask. It's very transparent. It doesn't need me to sit down and meet with anybody. Although, of course, I would welcome any meeting. But my questions remain the same. They're very clear. And I want answers that are as clear. Okay, we have about five minutes left before the president will have to leave, so we have time for just a couple of last questions. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Mr. President, uh, about your thoughts and your feelings about the reaction to your visit, to your proposed visit to Ground Zero and your visit later this afternoon at Columbia University. Why do you think uh, both of those proposed visits have caused such controversy in New York City? Last year, I wanted to go to Ground Zero as well. I was interested in expressing my sympathy to the victims of that tragedy. And I think that it is the responsibility of all of us to also understand the root causes of events like 9-11. And that was on my plan and agenda this year as well. Columbia University has invited me to be there. It is an official invitation. And there are some pro-government members of the press that, were, that objected to it very severely. They've provoked the people. So and this is sad to watch. I think we should all have the capacity to listen to everything. I m announce explicitly and clearly here. We oppose the way the U.S. government tries to manage the world. We believe it's wrong. We believe it leads to war, discrimination, and bloodshed. And that we propose more humane methods of establishing peace. We think that the world can be led in more humane ways than it is now through peace, brotherhood, and friendship, and through justice. We say this very clearly. Why is it that some people don't want to hear anything else or people to hear another point of view? 
It goes against the grain of freedom of speech and freedom of information here. All voices should be heard. Last year, a reporter asked me about what the President of the United States had uh, said to the Iranian people about addressing them. And I welcomed it. I said, we want him to talk to our people every day. Whatever comes to his mind, he should tell our people. And we will encourage people to hear what he has to say as well. I'm surprised in a place where they claim that they have freedom of information. They are trying to prevent people from talking. That's not good. <laughs> okay. In 1979, during the Islamic Revolution in Iran, Iranian students captured more than 50 American hostages and held them captive for 444 days. Do you believe this was morally justified? And if so, why? Or was it wrong? I propose we don't return to uh to the past, because then we'd have to talk about records of 25 years of measures taken by the U.S. administration inside Iran, and that history as well, from the coup in 1953 to, through its support of a dictatorship and the humiliation of the Iranian people and efforts to divide Iran and to insult the Iranian people, robbing Iran of its resources, and defending Saddam during an eight-year war against Iran, I think everything should be examined with its, its own time period and frame. And instead of the past, we must now begin to think of the future. Let the future be a bright future. Um, last question is about the future, and um, it kind of reflects upon the fact that here in the United States we have very long presidential campaigns, um, and it would prompt an American reporter to ask, do you plan on running for re-election in two years? What do you think? <laughs> I think I'll listen to what you have to say. That smile would seem to indicate that perhaps you're running. Well, I want to see what you have to say for once, too. <laughs> I have no opinions on Iranian politics. The press, if I ran and became if I, as a candidate again, <laughs> because every day you'll be, you'll have news about peace, good news coming. Great. Thank you very much, President Ahmadinejad, for joining us here today. I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Howard Rothman, Tina Creek, Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, and Joanne Booz for organizing today's event. Also, I'd like to especially thank NPC General Manager Bill McCarran and our former General Manager John Bloom for all that they've done to make today's event happen. And thanks to the NPC Library for its research. In addition, I would like to thank Mohammad Mir Ali Mohammadi of the Iranian Mission to the United Nations and Javad Zarif, Iran's former ambassador to the UN, for their extraordinary efforts to make this event happen today. Thank you. We're adjourned. من هم اجازه بدید تشکر بکنم از این ترجور از ناشنال پرس کلوب کلیرنس پیج کالمنست و ممبر از ایدیتوریال بورد در شکاگو تریبیون Dr. Kaveh Afraziabi, Professor of International Relations at Bentley College, author of books on Iran's foreign and nuclear policies, and a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the podium, Angela Greiling Keene of Bloomberg News, the chair of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Myron Belkind, a member of the Speakers Committee and the member of the committee who organized today's luncheon. Greta Van Susteren, anchor of Fox News is on the record. 
John Allen, correspondent for Congressional Quarterly, Eleanor Clift, contributing editor to Newsweek and regular panelist on the McLaughlin Group, and Tom Baldwin, Washington bureau chief for the Times of London. <clears throat> for nearly a century now, the National Press Club has brought the world's leading newsmakers to this stage. Yasser Arafat, Golda Meir, Nelson Mandela, and Nikita Khrushchev are just a few of the notables who have all addressed the world from the National Press Club. And today, we are hosting one of the most newsworthy heads of state in the world, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, President of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Here at the National Press Club, it's our job to facilitate the news, to help bring newsmakers and journalists together. That's exactly what we're doing here today. We're not endorsing anything the President has said or will say, just as we didn't endorse what Fidel Castro said when he spoke at the National Press Club. We simply arranged for this opportunity for President Ahmadinejad to share his thoughts with us. One thing is different and historic about this National Press Club luncheon. This is the first video conference luncheon in the 100-year history of the National Press Club. We invited President Ahmadinejad to join us via video from New York, where he is attending the UN General Assembly. President Ahmadinejad, welcome to the National Press Club. In the name of God, the compassion. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club for our luncheon today with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the President of the Islamic Republic of Iran. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm President of the National Press Club and Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests who are joining us here today along with the working press and the audience that's watching us on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech and afterwards I will ask as many questions from the audience as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Ron Bajans, Washington correspondent for the Kuwait News Agency. Lucy Morion, Washington representative for Reporters Without Borders. Ken Melgren, Manager of Affiliate Relations at Associated Press Broadcast. Hiroki Sugita, Washington Bureau Chief of Kyoto News Agency of Japan. Donna Leinwand, correspondent for USA. At the Merciful. The President is reciting verses from the Holy Quran in Arabic. I am very glad to sit down and meet with members of the press and congratulate the hundredth year of your activities. And at the outset, I would like to uh, raise a fundamental uh, question. On a key issue. I'd like to invite all to look at world events. When we take a look around us, we're not happy with what we see. Indeed, it is the most unsatisfactory state of affairs. Insecurity, discrimination, and threats of war and security concerns have affected everyone. Continuous wars. Have in fact hurt the human spirit. I believe if we look at the root cause of some of these problems, we will be able to think of how to build a better future, a more prosperous future based on peace and security for all humanity. I believe we all believe strongly that it is possible to create a better world for humanity and to realize this sublime and beautiful goal we need to take a look and revise how we view the world around us 
in looking for the root causes of the world problems today, we first look confront deviations on how mankind is viewed. 